welcome students now we are going to uh, have a look at a very important topic uh, from mbbs point of view that is malignancy affecting the breast breast cancer now to introduce it is the most common form of cancer affecting middle aged women mainly in the western countries but now the incidence is also increasing in our indian scenario it has now superseded ca cervix that is affecting females initially ca cervix was number one cancer affecting females now ca breast has taken over every one in 12 females are getting affected with this notorious disease that is ca breast in uk in india also it has increased quite a lot now we'll see a little bit of the epidemiology of this disease the incidence as you know male and female both have breasts but the malignancy affection and the relation is different in males it is 1 while in females it is 99 so the ratio is 1 is to 99 western countries is much more compared to eastern countries common age what we have observed is between 35 to 55 years of age it is uh, rare in lesser than 20 years uh, and more than 90 years only 20 percent or one fifth of the females are getting affected with this disease developed countries are somehow getting more affected with this condition and high social economic strata or affluent lifestyle is also affecting this particular condition now we look at the etiological factors there are various factors contributory to this particular disease first we'll understand the basic genetic model what is happening to this uh, condition there are two important genes that have been observed and uh, they have been narrowed that is the BRCA1 that is BARC1 and BARC2 genes and they, those are located on chromosome 17 and chromosome 13 respectively there is also one more important tumor suppressor gene that is called as p53 gene it is basically present in every individual and it actually suppresses the tumor so when this tumor suppression gene is deleted there is a chance that the patient is going to get affected with malignancy much more so deletion of this p53 is important family history is most important especially in females first degree relatives getting affected are directly contributory to the other relatives are getting affected if in a family mother is suffering from ca breast there is a chance that a daughter will suffer but if the sister is suffering from ca breast the relative risk increases much more in the other sibling so knowing that mother is affected with ca breast is definitely important you have to make aware that the daughter will be at risk but knowing that the sister is affected you have to be sure that this particular sibling is also affected and not only at risk because the relative risk as per the statistics has shown that in siblings it is much more commoner now there are various dietary changes that we have observed diet plays extremely important role in development of various malignancies nowadays in ca breast they do also affect in various situations like the diet which is low in phytosteroids the diet which is low in alcohol that is various uh, because of the urbanization of the society we have seen more and more females are consuming alcoholic beverages and because of which they are more prone for development of this malignancy now as due to the uh, side effect of the fast society uh, nowadays we tend to eat what is ready in front of us so we don't have time to properly cook anything so because of which a ready-made food that is consumed which especially lacks in micronutrients is very very high risk for development of ca breast fresh fruit fresh diet is very very important the diet which is low in citrus fruits also contributes to development of ca breast now this is an endocrine tumor and a hormonal tumor so it's very important that we should know the endocrine background of this tumor uh, it affects the nulliparous women more common basically it's very important for you to understand the correlation between the menstrual history and a reproductive history and the development of ca breast when the woman during her reproductive age group bears child at later age or breastfeeds less is more at risk of developing this malignancy 
so early child is considered to be a protective actually so first child at the age of 18 20 or 25 is much much better than having a child at age of 30 35 or 40 breastfeeding is very important uh, it is not only important for child's immunity it is also very important for the mother for protection of the breast for further development of malignancy obesity is directly proportional to the development of ca breast more obese is the female more is the chance of development of ca breast now few females because of the hectic lifestyle they tend to avoid the childbirth and they are prolonged on oral contraceptive pills now because of this prolonged exposure to the hormonal adjustment there is a risk of developing ca breast patients who have been put on hormonal replacement therapy due to various conditions like pcod that is a polycystic ovarian disease or some other conditions are also prone for development of ca breast eventually then the menstrual cycle achievement of early menarche and late menopause is directly proportional to development of ca breast the more is the span of this reproductive age more is the chance of the development of ca breast then the etiology <clears throat> previously history of any radiation exposure increases the risk of development of ca breast especially this is important when the child suffers from lymphoma and receives the mantle radiation which is exposing towards the upper chest or upper thorax so there is a chance of development of ca that is the ca thyroid as well as the ca breast now uh, again very very rarely that is the accidental radiation leaks but not so often in our country mainly in the western countries now we'll move on to the pathology very important pathologically as uh, we have already seen the basic breast lobule there are two main entities that is the ductal affection and affection of the lobules so two main var variants that we have observed that is the duct cell carcinoma and is a lobular carcinoma so duct cell carcinoma forms the commonest entity which comprises of 85% of the CA breast and the remaining 15% is affected by lobular carcinoma. The importance of knowing lobular carcinoma is it can be bilateral and multifocal disease as compared to ductal carcinoma which is unilateral and it can not be multifocal as uh, commonly. The genetic study is again very important <clears throat> and forms the mainstay and based on this we have subdivided these two broad categories into five different categories first commonest is a classical lobular carries better prognosis second is a colloidal carcinoma which carries again a moderate prognosis medullary carcinoma it is not so common but if present it carries poor prognosis inflammatory carcinoma it is a relatively newer entity what we have observed which was not so commonly seen initially 50 years back but nowadays we have seen so it is again a very notorious disease and it carries a very high risk of development and uh, towards the invasiveness and lastly in situ carcinoma now what is this in situ carcinoma in situ carcinoma means nothing but early carcinoma when the disease is limited to the basement membrane it is considered as in situ carcinoma when it breaches the basement membrane and involves the muscularis then we consider it as an advanced disease so in situ carcinoma carries a better prognosis now we'll talk a little bit about the relative risk now there are two main categories or two or three main categories where we have actually divided the risk of various breast pathologies eventually will lead to formation of ca breast first no increased risk means the patient should be totally reassured that he uh, she will not get affected with ca breast eventually that is adenosis because we have seen already that is during ANDA that is aberrations of normal development and involution these things happen during the cyclical changes during menstruation and during the physiological changes for a female so it will subside on its own unless there is some mutation so adenosis cysts duct ectasias these are uh, they are not going to carry uh, much risk or practically no risk for the female fibroadenomas again a benign condition fibrosis simple hyperplasia simple mastitis that is inflammation of the breast and even squamous metaplasia is considered as imposing no relative risk for further development of malignancy then there is a zone which will have or bear 
slightly increased risk of development of malignancy up to 2%. Now, two main headings come into this. That is a hyperplasia and second is papillary variant with a fibrovascular core. Now, these are the actual histological findings. But when we have done the FNSC for one suspicious lesion and it shows these two features, one should be aware that there is a 2% chance that this particular female eventually may develop CA breast. Moderate risk up to 5% that is typical picture showing a typical hyperplasia. And lastly, uh, there is one more category actually that is can't be ascertained actually to uh, whether it will give rise to or not. That is the solitary papilloma and some radical scar lesions which are rarer varieties. But yes, they do uh, sometimes carry the risk. Page and DuPont are the scientists who first gave this detailed description of this relative risk in 1978. So we categorize it accordingly. That is no relative risk, mild, moderate and inconclusive. Now we come to the assessment of these patients of CA breast. It's very important that you know this concept of triple assessment. Triple assessment is nothing but three different modalities used hand in hand for better treatment to the patient. That is a good clinical examination followed by good imaging modality followed by good pathological support. So you should be very thorough in your clinical examination when you are examining your patient for CA breast. Second thing, the imaging. What imaging that you are using? For example, mammography. And third thing is the pathology. That is the fine needle aspiration cytology or core needle biopsy depending on the situation. These three together will form as a triple assessment and uh, formulates the most important diagnostic tool. Now we'll see the rough distribution pattern as per Marshall's and Huggenbotham's classification, which gives a rough distribution, but it is very, very practically useful for us to understand that these are the quadrants which will be affected. I have given a small picture which will give you a better idea. Now in this left upper diagram, it is showing that upper and outer quadrant close to axilla this is the axilla which is shown 60% of the malignancy if occurring in this area it is going to be very very important out of 100% affection 60% of the patients of us are affected with this quadrant for our simplicity we have divided the breast into four main quadrants by these two imaginary lines going through nipple areola complex. So 60% is upper and outer quadrant, 10% is up, lower and outer quadrant, 12% is the nipple areola complex, 6% is the inner and lower quadrant and 12% is the inner or medial and upper quadrant. This is a CA affected quadrants, one should be well aware. So when a patient comes to you, majority of the patient that is 60% will fall into this particular group. Clinical features. Uh, now it is very very important that uh, CA breast will present to you in various phases and various stages. So what that patient is suffering one should know. Most important because all the malignancies initially are painless. So the patients come to us with delayed presentation. So they have painless lump in the breast. Second thing, they do come to us with nipple discharge. As we have already seen, blood, that is a sanguinous, is the most common nipple discharge coming from the nipple areola complex and which will be a hallmark for malignancy. Third thing that can happen is a nipple retraction. The normal angle is outward and upward. It will be retracted back in that affected patient. Patient may have nipple destruction altogether when the entire nipper area complex is getting eroded with the disease. This condition is called as a Paget's disease. Then there can be skin excoriations, there can be some axillary lumps, there can be a fungating mass in the breast and very rarely there can be ulceration means skin loss. So patient can initially present to us with skin ulcerations or some discharging areas affecting. Next thing, what is important is these patients can present to us initially with primary symptoms or symptoms related to the metastasis of this disease. 
that is the widespread distribution of this disease can initially present to us need not be a primarily lump is present and patient has come to you no patient can come to you with a delayed manifestation because as we all are aware uh, indian females are very tolerant in their uh, any uh, disease as such pattern this is not again an exception though this is a very important unit of their body still somehow they get ignored so we have to see the metastatic features of this disease so what these patients present to us with they present to us with backache what backache it can be an upper backache or lower backache patient present to us with bone pain they have cough with expectoration there can be breathlessness there can be abdominal distension there can be sometimes convulsions or seizures there can be jaundice and very very rarely in a terminal stage patients come to us with malignant cachexia that is patient becomes very bony this is a diagram which is showing or a photo showing typical situation of paget disease one can actually very much understand there is a nipple areola complex getting destroyed by this disease there is a little bit retraction of the nipple areola and eventually this entire complex will be a smooth surface now we move on to the investigating modalities now this being a very important condition we have to know the basic as well as the specialized investigations related to this condition basic investigations are complete blood count erythrocyte sedimentation rate liver function tests renal function tests blood group of the patient x ray chest and ecg specific investigations uh, now this disease being a, a very common condition there are various tumor markers available now what are these tumor markers these are nothing but the carbohydrate antigens which are located on the tumor epithelium which we can pick up and actually uh, depending on the uh, count we can actually ascertain whether this particular disease is obviously uh, present or not means for example uh, for ca breast ca 15 by 3 if it is 50 it is indicating that this particular patient is suffering from ca breast compared to if it is 5 so this is the basic importance of knowing a particular tumor marker relevant to particular condition second as we already seen fnc forms a gold standard for diagnosing various forms of disease if con if in conclusive there is a protocol now if fnc is in conclusive what we do we repeat an fnc in repeat fnc still if it is in conclusive which can actually happen practically then we need to subject such patients for core needle biopsy or core or true cut biopsy where a larger chunk of tissue is taken and studied mammography forms a very important tool for diagnosing early breast lesions it also serves a very important tool as a screening tool sonomammography when combined with a basic sonography it forms a very important investigative modality nowadays mri breast is considered to be gold standard rather than ct breast initially every disease to stage they used to use ct but nowadays because it's a soft tissue structure it is very important that one should be aware that mri will form a very important role now investigations for the metastasis is also very important one is the usg abdomen to pick up hepatomegaly to pick up ascites x ray dorsal lumbar spine to pick up any metastatic disease to see osteolytic changes ct scan brain to pick up the mets erythrocyte sedimentation rate that is esr as a prognostic indicator one needs to have a chart of esr x ray chest again to detect pulmonary metastasis because these patients can have cough with expectoration these patients can have breathlessness so depending on the investigations mri or ct scan one need to stage the disease now for staging there are two important classifications one is a tnm classification uh, it is more very very specific but it's a very complex uh, staging system so i have put here a very simple classification that is a manchester classification and this classification was devised by residents of manchester school uh, to have a simplicity in this complex issue so they have divided into four main stages now what are the four stages first growth limited to breast no lymph nodes in the axilla second stage growth limited to breast plus mobile axillary lymph nodes which will be hard third larger area of skin infiltration plus or minus pectoral fixation plus matted lymph nodes in the ipsilateral axilla lastly 
complete chest wall fixation of the malignant set or malignant site with metastasis that is a distant metastasis now this particular phenomenon of entire chest wall getting affected and getting fixed is considered a like a shield by the worn by ancient warriors so we compare it and label it as cancer and curase means like a warrior's plate the entire wall is very hardened and infiltrated with the tumor cells so this is a typical appearance which is uh, actually carrying a bad prognosis for the patient and it's a very advanced disease where only palliation will come into picture now this manchester classification is very useful but it has its limitations hence tnm is considered better but yes you should have a better guideline before understanding the tnm where t stands for tumor n stands for node and m stands for metastasis now it's very important for you to understand the mode of spread it goes by four main modes one is a local spread that is by continuity and contiguity means suppose there is affection of particular area of breast so it will spread laterally that is a continuity and by contiguity means if it is see a breast then the pectoral fascia will get affected by remaining adjacent to it that is continuity and contiguity second is through lymphatics that is early stage to the axillary nodes okay and to internal mammary nodes late stage to supraclavicular lesions and to the opposite side that is the contralateral side third stage or third mode is a hematogenous or blood bone in which it infiltrates to lumbar vertebrae which is the commonest site for a metastasis of ca breast through vertebral venous plexus because of which the dorsal lumbar spine is commonly affected and eventually it affects the femur thoracic vertebrae rib cage and the skull fifth mode is a transcelomic or transperitoneal when we call it as a cancer shower the tumor cells like a shower are spread from the breast to the abdominal cavity and lastly which is rare but implantation that is post procedure if you do a core biopsy inadvertently there is a possibility that tumor which was present within are getting infiltrated all along the path of the disease now this ca breast being a very vast topic uh we'll see into a subsequent session so far what we have seen is the etiology the pathological perspective of the tumor various investigative modalities and the mode of spread that is very very important for you to understand thank you